It all started with a minor change on our planet. At first, people noticed the moon had become brighter and a little bigger. But nobody paid attention to this. The moon affected tides all over the world. The water flooded the beaches, but it wasn't a tragedy. A lot of fish came close to the shores. People found giant squid, anglerfish, and other creatures next to the coast, although they usually live in the dark depths. New, stranger things happen every day. Birds no longer fly to the south in winter. They gather in huge groups flying around cities with no purpose. The moon used to help them navigate in nature, so they can't figure out which way to fly anymore. In the boundless waters of the world's oceans, ship captains notice that compasses are now unstable. The arrow is pointing in different directions since the Earth's magnetic poles have changed. People realize the moon has started to approach Earth for an unknown reason. The moon's gravity affects the gravity of our planet. This entails changes in the climate, the behavior of all living beings, and the magnetic field. Now, it rains in the driest places and gets hot in the coldest lands. It's knocking down ecosystems all over the planet. People living near forests hear wolves howling all the time. The moon drives these animals mad. The Earth's natural satellite is growing in size and lights up the night much brighter. Nothing critical has happened yet. People don't panic because they don't want to believe the end is coming. But then, one day, the moon reaches a critical point. You're walking down the street listening to music, and at that moment, someone pushes you. Okay, maybe that guy is late for work. You keep walking, and a girl coming by hits your shoulder. I'm sorry, she says, and goes away. You've noticed the fear in her eyes. You look ahead and see people running towards you. You take off your headphones and hear screams and sirens. People leave their cars and run away. Hundreds of seagulls are flying in the sky. You hear a strange noise among all the sounds of chaos. It seems to be water. How is this possible? You're in the city center, a few miles from the shore. But there's no time to think. You notice a huge wave flooding the streets and heading straight to you. You run into a building and go up to the 10th floor. From here, you're watching the water filling the city. The strong stream blows all cars, one-story buildings, and trees off the road. You notice a shark and other fish in the water. People are hiding in houses and on the roofs. The whole city is quickly plunging into a catastrophe. The TV is working in the building where you're hiding. You learn that floods are occurring all over the world. Massive tsunamis cover coastal cities. In some places, waves reach the height of a 30-story building. Many towns have been washed off the face of the Earth. The moon is too close to Earth, and massive floods are just the beginning. The moon flies around Earth and helps to keep our home on its axis. The moon provides climate stability and helps living organisms develop. But now, this balance is broken. The moon is approaching and changing our planet's gravity. Earth can tilt slightly to the side and provoke massive floods around the world. Imagine that you're holding a round glass of water. Tilt it a little. See how the liquid moves from one side to another? The same thing is happening now with the oceans. But the moon is not just approaching us. It's flying around the planet and getting closer with each circle. It causes natural disasters in different locations on Earth all the time. Now the ocean floods one side, and a few hours later, another. So you see all the water going back from the streets to the shore. The oceans may return to the city again by the end of the day. Wait a minute. It seems the end of the day has already come. You notice that the sky has become dark. It's weird, because it's only 3 p.m. The moon changes Earth's rotation speed and makes the day go faster. The moon covers almost the entire sky and brightly illuminates our planet. You see huge lunar craters. It's so close that you can still see it even when the sun shines. In some places, the passing moon obscures the sun. The water is leaving the streets and everyone goes outside. At this moment, an earthquake begins. The road is cracking and the houses are collapsing. There are landslides on the street. Tectonic plates are shifting all over the planet. 
Imagine two magnetic balls that are approaching each other. So, one ball is the moon, and the second one is Earth's core. What do you think will happen to what's above the core? That's hundreds of thousands of miles of the Earth's crust. And now, it's all moving. Destructive cracks are emerging all over the world. The planet's highest mountains break down and turn into a pile of stones. The seabed cracks and releases magma from the underground depths. Volcanoes wake up and erupt magma. Clouds of volcanic ash cover the sky from the sun and the glowing moon. But the scariest thing is still ahead. A collision is inevitable. The moon flies around the planet like a ball in a round glass with a hole in the center. This force drives clouds all over the planet. Now there's a thunderstorm, but in five minutes, it will be snowing. Then the night comes and it starts raining. Water droplets consist of mud and volcanic ash. It's difficult for people to breathe without gas masks. Atmospheric pressure is constantly changing. Some people experience severe migraines, and some have sore joints. But there's no time to think about your health. Humanity needs to figure out how to save itself from the collision. A new gravitational order will come when the moon crashes into Earth. Continents will change their shape. They will combine into one giant piece of land or split into a hundred smaller ones. The energy of the collision can burn all the oxygen in the atmosphere and make the planet unsuitable for life. Hiding underground also makes no sense because of deep earthquakes. People decide to spend their last hours with loved ones and their families. The moon is getting closer. It's now at the same distance as the International Space Station. The moon covers the sky. Many cities are in the shadows because of the waves. Tsunamis, several miles in height, crash down on the ground. Millions of tons of magma collide with the ocean. Billions of gallons of water just evaporate. Moisture rises into the air, mixes with ash, and floods the land in the form of giant cumulus clouds. You've accepted the complete destruction of the planet. But something strange happens to the moon at this moment. You notice giant cracks appear on it. The moon slowly begins to divide into two parts. Both halves crumble into hundreds of large pieces. It's just falling apart. The Earth doesn't have a natural satellite anymore. It's just a pile of giant space rocks. But why is this happening? There's a space around our planet called the Roche Limit. In this place, the gravity of Earth is stronger than that of the moon. This means that the forces holding the moon together are weaker than those that tear it apart. People are cheering. The Roche Limit has saved the planet. The moon won't hit us. It breaks up into millions of fragments and forms a circle around our globe. Now, Earth looks like Saturn. A belt of moonstones surrounds us. Huge chunks destroy everything in their path. All the space debris. The satellites are no longer working. Humanity loses its means of communication and navigation. People will have to use paper maps again. The moon held our planet's orbit at a certain angle before these events. Now the axis is tilted differently. One hemisphere becomes closer to the sun, and the other plunges into shadow. The North Pole and the Arctic may turn into hot deserts, and the equator of the planet may be covered with ice. Winter and summer can last for years. The moon's remnants fly around Earth, but some of them fall on our planet. Lunar meteor showers destroy cities and create giant craters. All these events lead to the massive destruction of life on Earth. It will take hundreds of thousands of years to adapt to the new world. Imagine stepping out of your spacecraft and setting foot on the surface of the moon. Under your feet, the ground is covered with a fine material that looks like powder. That's lunar dust. You look around and take a lungful of fresh air. It smells very different from the air on Earth, but still nice. Now, unfortunately, this is a highly unlikely scenario. And one of the reasons is that the Moon has almost no atmosphere. Earth's natural satellite is too small, less than 2% of our planet's mass. That's why it doesn't have a magnetic field strong enough to keep an atmosphere. But even if the Moon had it, solar winds would immediately pull it away. But if you could visit the Moon 3 or 4 billion years ago, oh, you'd see a very different picture. 
At that time, the Moon most likely had an atmosphere. It formed at the times when powerful volcanic eruptions were rocking the satellite. Gases spread all over the Moon's surface. It happened so fast that they didn't have enough time to escape into space. At that time, the lunar surface was covered with basins filled with volcanic basalt. Just imagine, ginormous plumes of magma hurling high into the air, falling to the ground, forming lava flows. That's how the basalt basins appeared on the surface of the Moon. At one point, scientists on Earth got their hands on samples brought from the Moon. They found out that lava flows there contained not only carbon monoxide and sulfur, but also the building blocks of water. Thanks to these samples, researchers managed to calculate the amount of gas that rose and formed the atmosphere. It became the thickest around 3.5 billion years ago and existed for about 70 million years. After that, poof, the atmosphere was lost in space. But the coolest thing? When the Moon did have an atmosphere, the satellite was 3 to 10 times closer to our planet. One computer simulation even suggested the Moon was probably up to 19 times closer than it is now. The distance between it and our planet could be 18,600 miles. Well, these days, it's around 240,000 miles. That's why the Moon looked much, much bigger in the sky. Unfortunately, at that time, not even dinos were around to admire the view. Hm, neither was I. At the same time, the most recent studies have confirmed that our Moon actually does have an atmosphere. It's composed mostly of hydrogen, neon, and argon, and contains some very unusual gases, like potassium and sodium. You can't find them in, let's say, the atmospheres of Mars, Venus, or Earth. Sadly, such an atmosphere isn't suitable for us oxygen-dependent creatures. But guess what? There's loads of oxygen on the Moon. Nah, I know, it must sound confusing. But the thing is, this oxygen isn't in its most common gaseous form. Nah, it's trapped in a layer of rock and dust covering the surface of the Moon. This layer is called the regolith, and it contains up to 45% oxygen. So, does it mean that if people learned how to extract this oxygen, we would be able to live on the Moon? Eh, not so fast. The oxygen in those rocks is very tightly bound into the minerals. And to break these components apart, we'd need tons of energy and special equipment. But if people managed to start this process, the Moon would deliver quite a lot of oxygen. Now, there's a theory that the Moon might have been formed during a collision between Earth and another planet. This planet must have been smaller, the size of Mars. It probably happened around 4.5 billion years ago. Another theory claims that the Moon used to be an asteroid or some other wandering body. It formed somewhere else in the solar system. When it was passing by Earth, it got caught by our planet's gravity. Other experts think that at some point in the past, Earth was spinning so fast that some of its material broke away. It soon started to orbit our planet, and that's how the Moon appeared in the sky. And the least exciting theory claims that Earth's natural satellite could simply appear along with Earth during our planet's formation. These days, the Moon is the fifth largest natural satellite in our solar system. It's also one of the densest, second only to Jupiter's satellite Io. Most likely, the Moon has a tiny core, no bigger than 2% of the satellite's mass. About 420 miles wide, it consists mostly of iron and sulfur. The Moon's surface is dark, even though Earth's natural satellite is the brightest object in the night sky. But in reality, its reflectance is just a bit higher than that of asphalt. You might have heard that the Moon, along with the Sun, causes tides in the oceans and seas on Earth. The satellite's gravitational pull creates something called the tidal force. It makes the water bulge out on the sides that are the closest to the Moon and farthest from the satellite. These bulges are what we know as high tides. But what not so many people know is that the Moon also causes rocks to rise and fall, just like it does with water. Of course, this effect doesn't look as dramatic as ocean tides, but it's still noticeable. Earth's solid surface moves by an inch or so with each tide. Now, not only does the Moon cause tides on our planet, but it also slows down its rotation. This phenomenon is known as tidal breaking. It increases the length of a day on Earth by a bit more than 2 milliseconds per 100 years. The Moon is also moving away from Earth, 
at the same rate at which your fingernails grow. That's about one and a half inches per year. Um, you should really cut those. If one day it floats away into space, our planet will have to live through tough times. Without the stabilizing pull of the moon's gravity, Earth's tilt would start changing wildly. From no tilt at all, meaning no seasons, to a large tilt, resulting in extreme weather. Since the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, nothing protects it from extreme temperatures. It gets incredibly cold on the night side, minus 390 degrees Fahrenheit. Meanwhile, the sunny side is literally boiling, with a temperature of 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Another thing the moon can't protect itself from without an atmosphere is meteorites. That's why the surface of the satellite is dotted with craters. For comparison, there are about 190 identified impact craters on our planet. Many of them are hidden by vegetation or covered with water. But if we speak about the moon, the number is so much greater – several million. And around 5,000 of them are more than 12 miles across. The moon is less seismically active than Earth. That's why these craters and other ancient formations stay in perfect condition for centuries. But even though the moon's surface is mostly dormant, Earth's natural satellite still experiences moonquakes. They start several miles beneath the surface. One theory suggests that they may be happening because the moon is shrinking as its insides are cooling. Scientists say the moon has become around 150 feet skinnier than it used to be several hundred million years ago. So, how does it work? Well, picture a grape turning into a raisin. It wrinkles while shrinking. The same is happening to the moon. It's shrinking and it's wrinkling. But unlike a grape, the moon doesn't have any flexible skin. Its surface is hard and brittle. So as the moon gets smaller, the crust cracks and breaks. Its sections get pushed over neighboring parts. Researchers are sure that such faults are still active and likely responsible for the quakes shaking the moon. Some of these quakes are pretty strong, up to 5 on the Richter scale. When you look up at the moon, you always see the same side of Earth's natural satellite. Like our planet, the moon rotates around its axis. But this rotation lasts around 27 days. This is the same time the moon needs to orbit Earth. Such a phenomenon is called tidal locking. Before space exploration started, people had never seen the other face of the moon. They didn't know what the far side looked like. While the near side of the moon is mostly large plains covering impact basins, the far side is rugged and cratered. The crust is thicker there, with less evidence of volcanic activity. Oh, by the way, the moon isn't perfectly round or spherical. It's shaped like an egg. When you're looking at it, one of its small ends is always pointing at you. Yep, right at you. This is the reason why the moon's center of mass isn't its geometrical center. In reality, it's a bit more than one mile off-center. Like a poorly made golf ball. Every April, a group of scientists observes the faint glow of asteroids passing by our planet. One year, they realized there was something weird shimmering in their telescopes. The team expected it to be another asteroid. But they ended up very surprised, because what they discovered was an unusual space rock that didn't consist of the minerals that usually make up asteroids. It was made of silicate, the material mostly found on the moon. They named it Kamo Oaliwa, which is a Hawaiian word that means wobbling celestial object. The rock didn't match any near-Earth asteroids scientists had already been familiar with. Instead, that piece had a pattern of reflected light similar to that of the moon rocks astronauts had brought back from NASA missions. This fragment turned out to be a quasi-satellite, which is a kind of asteroids that orbit both our planet and the Sun. It repeatedly circles Earth and has a quite unusual tilt. That's the reason you can only see it in the night sky once a year. The fragment is pretty shy, too. Aww. It never gets closer to our planet than 9 million miles. That's almost 40 times as far away as the Moon. Plus, this space body often hides in the shadows. Scientists have figured out the piece won't stay in this orbit for a long time. It probably arrived at its current position about 500 years ago. And its orbit is likely to change in the next 300 years. This fragment may not be alone out there in space. Mm -mm. There are at least three more similar near-Earth objects. They may have all come from the same place. Researchers aren't sure yet about the nature of the rock, 
But they can find out more about this unusual space object if they send a spacecraft to collect samples and bring them to Earth. That's something China's space agency is planning to do later this decade. Now, the moon appeared in the middle of chaos. There are several theories about how that happened. The first one claims the moon used to be just a wandering body, similar to an asteroid. It formed somewhere in our solar system. Once, it approached too close to Earth and got captured by our planet's gravity. The second theory says that our planet was spinning so quickly that some material broke off and started circling around it. One of the largest pieces was the moon. The third theory says that the moon was formed at a time when our planet was going through its own formation process. But today, the most widely accepted theory goes like this. Once, a long, long time ago, but not in a galaxy far, far away. Earth collided with a Mars-sized planet. The debris and clouds of dust from the collision gathered around our planet and started circling it. Eventually, something that we today know as the Moon formed there. Apollo missions brought more than a third of a ton of soil and rock from the lunar surface. These rocks show that the Moon had mostly the same building materials as our planet. This might mean they have a common history. If the Moon had been formed somewhere else and had been eventually captured by the gravitational force of our planet, it would have a different composition. Also, if it had been created at the same time as our planet or had once broken off, there would be the same minerals on both the Moon and Earth. But the minerals on the Moon contain less water. Plus, our planet's natural satellite is rich in materials that form fast at high temperatures. Now, the Moon isn't the only space body in the solar system with a mysterious past. Hippocamp is Neptune's moon, discovered in 2013. It's the smallest moon of this ice giant, a mere 21 miles across. It's very close to Proteus, the biggest of Neptune's inner moons. And no, Hippocamp is not a place for big African mammals to spend the summer. Scientists think Hippocamp probably formed from debris after Proteus collided with a comet. If Hippocamp had entered Proteus's orbit from some other place in our solar system, the bigger moon would have either swallowed it or booted the tiny moon away. But not even Proteus itself is among the first generation of Neptune's moons. It was formed from the remains of the planet's earliest system of moons. Those first moons were destroyed when Neptune captured Triton, currently the largest of its moons. The main evidence proving the collision was likely to happen is the fact that Triton circles around Neptune backward unlike other moons orbiting the planet. Neptune captured Triton from the Kuiper Belt. That's an area filled with icy objects and rocky debris stretching beyond Uranus. That means Hippocamp is a third-generation moon. Kind of like a second cousin twice removed or something. Now the Sun also had a turbulent past. Our star appeared about 4.6 billion years ago. It's hard to study its early stages of life since that happened 50 million years before our planet was even formed. But recently, a team of researchers has discovered crystals that are over 4.5 billion years old. Hidden deep within meteorites, they've revealed some things about the past of our Sun. Before the planets were formed, our solar system had consisted of a central star and a massive disk of dust and hot gas spiraling around it. As the dust and gases cooled down, they turned into minerals, including the crystals found in the meteorites that landed on our planet. Those ancient materials were irradiated, unlike some younger substances. Researchers think something might have happened to the Sun after those crystals were formed. Perhaps the activity of our star was less intense then. Or maybe, for some reason, these younger materials couldn't travel to the areas where irradiation was possible. Dwarf planets give us a chance to sneak a peek into the ancient years of the solar system. Around 4 billion years ago, Jupiter's, Saturn's, and Neptune's gravitational forces joined. They sent asteroids and comets hurtling across the solar system, making them collide with different planets. All the dwarf planets from the Kuiper Belt, for example Pluto, Eris, Haumea, Makimaki, have their own moons that likely formed after some powerful collisions. Icy debris in orbits similar to Haumea's, for example, can prove the theory of an ancient collision. The debris it created simply didn't have enough energy to float away from the dwarf planet's gravitational pull. Ceres, another dwarf planet, has ammonia-rich clays on its surface. Ammonia isn't stable at the temperatures prevailing on Ceres. But there's plenty of this substance in the outer solar system. It means that Ceres was probably formed in those outer parts and got kicked inward. After all, the gas giants were migrating a lot at those early stages of the solar system. 
Or the dwarf planet could have formed in an asteroid belt, and ammonia somehow, let's say after a powerful impact, appeared on the dwarf planet. Ceres might help scientists understand icy moons better. The ocean floor on Earth has a high concentration of carbonate minerals, and some parts of Ceres have them too. This means this dwarf planet is like some sort of fossilized ocean world. Many exoplanets, a term used for planets outside the solar system, have also gone through pretty intense collisions in their early stages. This double star system is more than 300 light years away from us, and its stars are at least 1 billion years old. Even though it's not young, this system still shows some signs of swirling clouds of dusty debris that haven't cooled down yet which isn't something you'd expect from a star system of this age. This debris is still warm. It means there might have been a strong collision of two planets or some other space bodies of similar size in that region and relatively recently. So hey, everybody just simmer down. Dust particles circle around a young star. They stick together and grow bigger with time. That's how planets form. The leftover dust often settles in some distant cold areas. An example in our solar system is the Kuiper Belt. It's located far away, beyond Neptune. As solar systems evolve, those particles keep colliding until they're so small they end up being pulled into nearby stars or kicked out of the system. Uranus spins on its side if you compare it with the rest of the planets in our solar system. And the only way we can explain it is a powerful collision in the past something much bigger than a regular comet or some other space body of similar size likely hit Uranus and knocked the planet on the side. It was probably a planet twice the size of Earth. It could be a protoplanet. This is a space body made up mostly of ice and rock that orbits a star and is likely to develop into a planet sometime in the future. Anyway, the fallout from the impact smothered the core of Uranus. It prevented the heat inside the planet from escaping. This might explain why Uranus has extremely cold temperatures on its surface. Man, bring a jacket and a blanket.